Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, genderidentitytoday.com. This content is brought to you by subscribers of genderidentitytoday.com. If you are already a subscriber, first of all, thank you so much for your ongoing support, because subscribers not only receive new content directly to their email inboxes as soon as it publishes, but you also get to interact with every single contributor directly, which includes me, And right? So if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, videos, and written articles by all of our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. I am actually beyond thrilled at introducing my guest, Jenna Tellendrew. Hi, Jenna. Hi, so good to be here, and I'm thrilled to be here as well. I am still I still have pal palpitations. You're still one of my heroines, so I've got to figure out how to conduct and conduct an, an interview. So, so Jenna is an author, a Celticist, and a priestess, and probably most important to me right now, the founder of the Sisterhood of Avalon. Now, I read um, Jenna's book, which I'll hold up, Avalon Within, this one here, uh, which was one of the first books um, about the Avalonian tradition, and it teaches uh, a distinctly feminine path. And, and in particular to personal sovereignty. And that phrase strikes me really hard, Jenna. So that's why I wanted to talk to you today. So thank you so much for, for agreeing. I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much for asking me. It was, uh, it was, it's quite an honor and I'm so, I'm really happy Aww. to be here. So thank you. Thank you so much. No, thank you. So we, we need to stop thanking each other. <laughs> well, maybe I might have to edit that bit out. There's too many things. I have a whole chapter. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. So I want to start. You were you were about to tell me a story about the 1980s, but I but I wanted to ask because um, you you know whenever you do a podcast, everybody always talks beforehand, and then all the best stuff never gets recorded, which is a shame. But you know, I, I stopped you. You did. <laughs> but I want I want to ask about like your whole life because I think about all the what you've written about. And I, and I wonder, I mean, has this always been like a magical life? Has there always been all of these influences? To, take me back to baby Jenna. <laughs> well, I suppose, yes, in a way. Uh, I was very precocious. I read a lot of uh, Arthurian stuff from my wee, you know, 11, 12, 13 years yeah. old. I read The Mist of Avalon when I was 13. I was always into mythology. Uh, I loved King Arthur. And I wished I lived in ancient times so I could worship goddesses and be a priestess and all of those things. And then in 1986, I found the Women's Spirituality book by Diane Stein. And I sure. realized that, my goodness, that there are people who are doing this here and now and today who are goddess worshippers. And so that was my entree into magic, into paganism, into it was women's spirituality. And it not only... Um, you know, shaped my spiritual expression, but also my politics and my feminism and all those things have always been really intertwined. So following a female path of spirit has is just in my bones. It's been from the beginning. And again, like I said, it's very intertwined with um, with with my politics and with, uh, you know, the you know things that are important to me in, in the world. And, yeah. uh, you know, I've studied a lot of um, magic over the years. I studied hermetics and uh, Kabbalah and things of that nature. And, you know, what we were going to talk about in the 80s is this idea that um, one of the hermetic principles we talk about is the principle of gender, that everything has gender. And it was a very kind of polarity uh, kind of description of it. And the idea that people would incarnate into the body, uh, that was a reflection of the gender that they were choosing to express uh, or experience this particular life in. So this idea of reincarnation and the idea that the spirit itself is without gender, but that we experience life in a particular way. And it was very polarity. And so I, I did kind of you know, this, this strong polarity without so much degradations, right? That all kind of came later. And, I, you know, I'm bisexual. I was in, uh, you know, the back in the day in the late 80s, early 90s was in Ligba, right? So we didn't really have a lot of conversation back in the day about uh, trans or gender expressions or things of that nature. And so it just kind of kind of came back around to that later on in my life. But the idea that... Um, uh, you know, that gender is part of the bodily expression. And then over time, you know, 
because magic said so. But I think that not all magic, especially magic that derives from, you know, the Victorian era that has its own, you know, kind of biases around things is uh, necessarily what is needed for today. I think they're a product of its time. And I think it kept us kind of small around those things. And so the idea for me is, you know, um, if gender is uh, is what we're talking about, like where does female or women, womanhood reside in me? And we were talking about this earlier. If it's not in our physical bodies, because there are women who don't have breasts or don't have uh, or don't have wombs, sure. right? Yeah. Right. So are they not a female person? Are they not a woman? Or if you know, is it the things that we do? Is it how we dress? Is it how we present? I don't think so. I think, as I said, a woman's haircut is a, the haircut a woman has. Women's clothing are the clothes that a woman wears, right? So if it's not how we look, if it's not our physical body. If it's not the things that we do in the world, because, of course, we should choose to be who we are and, you know, our work in the world should be not. Right. So where does gender reside? And I think it's it's an imperceptible thing. I think it's in our spirit. I think it's in our heart. I think it's in our mind. And if we go back to this idea of hermetics, right, that not only this idea that everything has gender, but also the basic piece that like attracts like as the mind. So mm. the attention right as the body and so right. i think that for so many people who um who are trans who who feel like they are not matching their physical self with their true self if their mind is on that gender thing if anything they vibrate that female or that male energy because it's so mindful in them. It's so upfront as opposed to yes. people who never think about it at all. So I, I think over time uh, that while my spiritual path is so um, intensely gendered in a way, uh, and we can talk a little bit about more about why that is, because I think we are going to, but I do think that um, gender expression and, and, and how people identify and how they express themselves through identity through gender um, is not so cut and dry. And I think it's always important to be uh, mindful of things that are bigger than perhaps we can understand. Right. 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 I, I want to, I've got to follow up on this. I would, I almost kind of want to do it later on, but it's like, no, 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 no. You've, you've set it up. If gender doesn't reside in the body, if it's more mind, if it's more spirit, what's the role of the social environment? Well, I think that's it too. I mean, um, I spent a lot of time studying culture and I think that culture is a reflection of, uh, you know, of, of where we are as a, as, as, as a people, as a society at a given time. And I think that the reason why so much of this is up for us now in our society is because it's something we've not addressed for us in such a long time. And I think right. uh, feminism is what opened the door to it when we started breaking down those barriers. And I think that that it only makes sense that this is the next question. If women can do all of the things that we were told we could never do, like ride in a swift moving train without our uteruses going flying out of our bodies, like they used to say, um, what else perhaps is, is, is a construct that we don't necessarily need to be limited by? And I think that um, gender expression and uh, how we look at it in our society is part of that. And I think it's important for us to right. reflect. Right. You, you know, you, you are going against a, almost a sacred cow at this point to say, well, but gender is a social construct. So um, I think it is. I think it is a social construct. I think that, um, well, let's put it this way. I think that the limitations we put on what gender can do or should be like is social. I think that, um, I think there is an answering part in the individual, but I think that uh, how free we are to be what that inter internal part is, is the social piece. So I think it's an interplay yeah. between both of them. Yeah. Did you have you read all the things I've written or something? Because you keep on saying precisely what I I've haven't, written. but I want to because <laughs> the thing. So I had a, a women's studies major back in the late eighties, early nineties, but mm -hmm. um, things have evolved so much since then. And actually, I learn a lot from my kids. My kids are Gen Z and um, queer identified, and um, they teach me stuff all the time. So yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. No, I do. I think there's. There's so much more to talk about that because, you know, the idea of a social construct, I mean, originally was something that was going to be applied to scientific data. I mean, that's that's a philosopher from like the 16th century, Michel de, de Montaigne, I think his name is. And originally the idea of social constructionism came out of 
the idea of, you know, like if, if science defines the color blue as a certain frequency, like range of freak of uh, wavelengths, mm -hmm. um, does society have to call it blue? Blue is a science is a, is a, is a construct is what the guy was saying. So there's a difference between scientific definitions and, and ultimately what society chooses to, to mm -hmm. endow the word with. So, but totally true. Cause there's, just more. We're much more than just our society. So we are, but I think that the things in our society is a reflection of, of, of the spirit of, of the time. And right. that's what's partially interesting about, I think the Avalonian piece. Uh, we can look at, for example, Morgan Le Fay, who at the beginning of the story was a essentially a goddess, a demigoddess, a, a, a sure, supporter sure. of Arthur, a, uh, you know, a heroine. But as time progressed, and the Arthurian tradition in the stories have been around for over a thousand years. And so stories are a, a big part of culture. It's just like our media today. It's a reflection of the belief systems of the people who tell the stories, especially stories in oral tradition. So as time has progressed, she's shifted to become, from being his great ally to being his mortal enemy, trying to kill right. him. She holds the sins of the of the woman, the sins of magic, the sins of sexuality. So even just tracing her evolution is a story of what culture believed about women and women's places and the ways in which they were a danger to the status quo. And so that's part of the reason why it's so interesting to study culture, to understand the past, and also to look at our culture to understand the present. And what can we do to kind of mold our culture in a direction that is... Um, supportive and open and, um, you know, has unlimited potential for people in the future. And I think that's the power of right. understanding how that's worked in the past and the power of the moment. I'm 100% on that same page because we're looking at politics right now going, why can't we do nothing? Why is everything one big polarized mess? I don't know how much I want to talk about that. What is, what would be much better? I'm curious. So personal sovereignty, especially mm -hmm. when we're talking about existing within a social environment, we get these social expectations. Mm -hmm. there's, there's social pressure to be somebody that maybe you don't want to be. Mm -hmm. So what, what role does personal sovereignty, am I, and, and hopefully I'm, I'm using the, the phrase in the way you wanted it to be used, but so how does personal sovereignty fit into that? So sovereignty has been a huge piece of Arthurian, Avalonian, Celtic, Welsh culture right. from the beginning, right? So, and I think the beauty of myth, right, is that we can look at it from different perspectives. Uh, it can be physical, like a goddess and a king mating to, to you know, join to, you know, the sacred marriage, but it can also be Protect the roles the land, of male and yeah. female, right? Exactly. It can be the roles of the conscious and the unconscious self. We can look at it in many different ways. And I look at personal sovereignty as conscious self-determination, right? So today we're not discern, dis determining, uh, although might might work well, you know, who gets to rule the land, but in our inner landscape, that's what we have power over. And, um, you know, the idea that if we know ourselves well enough to understand both the light and the shadow, uh, the truth of the whole of the self, we can make choices about who we are and the, the things in our lives that are in alignment with that sovereignty that don't, uh, and I say conscious self-determination because there are a lot of unspoken, unconscious things that we've been taught from a young age, how yes. a woman's supposed to be, or what is appropriate in, in, in public, or, um, you know, you're going to take over the family business, or this is weird, you know, this is how one is a man, right? This is what the way to yeah. be a man. And so if those things are not in alignment with the truth of who we are, and first we need to figure out who the truth of who we are is, then we can make choices that are in alignment with that. And that's that's about work, walking a path of sovereignty. So if we are sovereign and the lives that we build around ourselves are sovereign, uh, first of all, I believe that in order to pursue sovereignty, I must honor the sovereignty of other people. So in a sense, that's beginning to make a shift in the world around us. And then you also are sh showing other people that, oh, you can opt, you can make different choices, you can opt out of that paradigm. What does that look like? Oh, there's someone who's doing it, I can do it too. So I think that eventually, yeah, yeah. the more people do it, the more it shifts the zeitgeist, I think, and then we become collectively more sovereign. But it starts with the self, it starts with the self. And to know ourselves well enough to know if the choices that are before us are made out of fear, out of limitation, out of unconscious 
shame or uh, programming that we've received, um, you know, things that we've learned in the world, um, perhaps there are different choices that we can make that are kind of like based in joy or based in promise or or based in potential or based in what brings me joy or who I really am, even if that's different from what my family wants that to be. Right, right. There is, so I, you know, now that I've transitioned gender, I, I have experienced, you know, life as a man, as it were, and personal sovereignty is different between men and women. Mm. How about if I just put a period there and I stop talking and like, this is a good platform, I think for you, but the, what's the, what's the distinction? There's, there's a difference and I know there is, but, but tell me, tell me how you see this, especially in, in relationship to uh, personal sovereignty. So I think it, for me, the thing that I find the most uh, instructive is to look back at the myths. And as I said, you know, we can look at them in many different ways, as actual, as, as metaphor, as psychological constructs. But the, the sovereignty myths are always about uh, there is a woman who is or a, f- a feminine figure or a feminine object, like a cauldron or a cup, uh, mm-hmm. that uh, there is a vessel that is the mediator between the worlds. And that it is something that is always in the keeping of the feminine. So whether or not we want to talk about gender polarity, things in the present, in the past, that was part of their culture. So it was always the feminine that was the mediator. So there's a sense that the feminine is the possessor of that, of that vessel. And then the masculine is uh, that which seeks the vessel, right? So you are seeking the grail, you're seeking the cauldron, you're seeking to be invested with sovereignty by the goddess of the land who will test the sovereign. So there is a sense then that one is a more external expect, you know, uh, um, process and one is a more internal process. I think for women today, we have to reclaim that vessel of sovereignty. We have to reclaim the power that is inherent within us that has been repressed over time. And I think the male, the male version is uh, that external seeking that, um, that, seeks unity with the feminine that seeks unity so we can look at it in many different ways so we seek unity to become the king right to have that sexual connection but it's the it's the conscious mind seeking the unconscious mind it is the 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 logical self seeking the you know the the emotional self so i think that the masculine path to sovereignty is one that needs to have that union of the conscious the unconscious the emotional and the logical whereas the female i think is just to recognize that our inherent power is always been inside of ourselves and we need to find it and claim it. Even if the constructs around us aren't in support of it, we can live in that matrix empowered, even if that matrix doesn't yet reflect that back to us. And I think the more we can encourage each other to come into sovereignty, hold a place for it, we, we, uh, this idea that the patriarchy, right, harms men as much as it harms women, I think the things that the patriarchy has taught women are our weaknesses, are really our strengths. And I think the things that the patriarch, and I think it's the same for, for, for men, that the things that are identified as being a weakness in men are also their strengths and that we need to find those things in ourselves. And I think yeah. that as, and I think we need to hold that space for each other, for women to come into their power and for women to empower men to experience those parts of themselves that are associated with femininity with womanhood because it isn't it's part of all of us but um we've made this artificial construct that women are the ones who cry and the men are the ones who are strong and 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 it harms both of us it harms both of us it definitely does that that hit me too the the idea that um that idea that the power of the woman has always been inherent it it kind of kills me the idea that that you have you know men who go look i've got like a gun or i have some big weapon right there's always a big weapon involved the lance they, or the sword <laughs> right yes the big it's old, always a big, big old lance excalibur you got lance a lot yeah that's was but somebody's got to have a big uh, some big weapon and the the power of the feminine is i mean like grants the power to it where did arthur get excalibur was given it, Something right? You know, That's Lancelot was was a great, um, you know, was a, was a great uh, fighter. But uh, gosh, was he was he was he Morgan's son? Is that the, how the story goes? He was. Uh, 
He was the uh, the foster son of uh, the Lady of the Lake. Okay. So he's, right. a, he's an otherworldly champion, right? So that whole fairy queen mythos, that's who he is. Um, but yeah, but he but he's her champion. So he, it's part of that, that she chose him. She raised him to be her champion. So he represents right. that, so, that piece. So yeah. granted him that, really granted him mm-hmm. that power. So I'm, I don't know if this is a good question or bad. Because like, I don't think the the masculine path needs to be one of, I'm going to use the word destruction, and I don't know if that's the best word I want to use, but I don't think it has to be one of destruction. It could certainly be one of construction, although it's typically the feminine path that we think of as, well, because because women are the ones who, who uh, you know, bear, bear the children nine months and then give birth. You know, it's women are the completers. And men are not. Men are the initiators. I mean, I think that I think there's something to that. And I think that's part of the reason why the Celts had this very kind of binary perspective around things. Right. That uh, they and I think ancient people did that. They noticed that things came through the female, that it took nine months. You know, you mentioned nine. Nine is such a huge number in the Avalonian tradition. Right. The number <laughs> of completion, of wholeness. Right. Um but I think that, um, but I think that there was a time, you know, one of the things we know about the, the, you know, the Iron Age Celtic people, so the pre-Christian Celtic peoples, is that the, these women were also warriors, and in fact, some of the greatest warriors in myth in Celtic lands, Cuchulain and Lancelot, for example, uh, Peridor, uh, they were trained by women, you know, women warriors, you know, even you know, perhaps goddesses or sovereignty goddesses. So there is right. something inherent in that that she is involved in that process. That that you know, like Arianrhod, um, uh, uh, you know, arming her son. Uh, there is a sense of that the feminine in, invests uh, um, uh, that sovereignty or that uh, authority uh, the authority comes through the feminine as a as a as a representative of the other world or the unconscious right. and that that yeah. also returns to her and so i think that there is something in that like i said it doesn't have to be a male wo- man woman masculine feminine it can be an active passive energetic it can be a, a conscious unconscious you know there are many di- different ways of looking at it but i think it's a, it's a it's the fundamental uh, functioning of a, a lot of Celtic mythos and magic, uh, it, it recognizes that they they are equally opposite and they complete each other, right? right? In that way, and so we can be equally opposite without having power over. It can be power with, and I think that the you know there is something to be said about that. The you know upper body strength of the man is better served for certain things and the lower body strength of the female may be better served for certain things but it doesn't mean that one can't do other things does that make sense it doesn't have to be Uh, yeah the total sum of what's available to us right no it makes perfect sense i mean the thing is too because i've read plenty of western magical tradition as well and i mean Mm -hmm. so when i learned about feminism. I actually learned it from somebody, I believe she was French, if I remember correctly, but she was a TA of mine for like an existentialism class. Mm. Like you can already see this whole thing's going, you know, it's going to be a great story. But she said to me, feminism, like you'll see people and they go, well, feminism, you know, means that, that women should be CEOs. And she said, feminism means that we should recognize the value of feminine energy that as, as a balancing and as a, um, uh, like a completion. And, and she was the first one who taught me about this idea that, that masculine actions are initiating and directing and feminine actions are receiving and completing. And I was like, well, that makes perfect sense. Like it actually even makes sense when you just think about sex. I mean, it's like, like how do you miss this obvious of a, of an allegory. I feel like I had a point. The anode in the cathode of a, of a, of a, the anode in the cathode of a, of a battery, the battery or the, sure. you know, the polarity of a, of a, you know, the, you know, of a, a magnet or, you know, yes. Electromagnetic fields, but all of these things have these polarities inherent in them and they can rec can, um, uh, what is it? Uh, rep- you know, uh, re- resemble right mm-hmm. the way we experience gender. But I'm sorry, I feel like I've I've cut you off. Go no, on. not so. at all. You know what though? I was an electrochemist in graduate school, so that you brought up anode yeah. and cathode because it's great. You can have a huge voltage and zero current because you have no place for it to go. 
And so mm. you can go look at this voltage is amazing. Look, I got a hundred thousand volts, you know, just sitting right here. And you go, what are you going to do with it? And you go, oh, do with it. Oh, crap. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Well, I got to have somewhere for it to go in order to, 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 you know, make a current and do, and do work with it. So I have never used an electrochemical, uh, you know, metaphor there. So thank you for, for granting something from my, look, see graduate advisor. I did learn something from graduate school, right? Yes, I was always moaning about Sorry, John, you weren't moaning, but he did say, why did you go into software? You could have been a chemist. And I'm like, well, being a chemist was kind of boring, but it was true. It was kind of boring. Anyway. You're following your sovereign self. Yes. That's oh, what it was. That's what it was. It's what it was. Um, I want to talk about, uh, we, we've gotten into spirituality and I, you mm -hmm. know, I said, do, does the masculine path have to be destruction, uh, destructive, but do we, you make a, a distinction or at least, you know, the Avalonian, the, the, when you came up with the Avalonian tradition, it did make a distinction between a feminine path and a masculine path. And, and we've talked a little bit, a little bit about it, but do we have like, do we have, well, I guess, let me start with this. Do we, do we have a gender in our relationship to the universe? Mm, what do you, can you clarify what you mean by that? Do we have a gender in relationship to numerous? What do you mean by that? Ah, oh, dang. I didn't think you'd uh, call me out. I'm just kidding. Well, I just want to make sure I'm answering <laughs> the question. Right. So um, answering the question you're asking. Well, part, part of the... So part of what has interested me... So I mean, obviously, if I'm transgender, I have some interest in gender. But what part of what drove my interest in particular in gender with... Or gender in magic is that mine changed. As I started transitioning, I felt, I felt my, I mean, I'm going to call it relationship to the universe. It changed the way I wanted to mm -hmm. do magic changed. And, and that was, you know, how ultimately I, I started talking to Josephine McCarthy. Cause I'm like, do you, have you ever seen this? And she's like, oh yeah, totally. You know, I, I get it totally. And I was like, damn, okay, well, I mean, what do I do? And she was like, well, write it out. And also write it mm -hmm. down, by the way. Don't. Mm -hmm. So if you go through right. this, make sure somebody else can can figure it out. But so that's what originally I didn't think there would be a difference. I figured I was just magic was magic, but I changed when when in, in my relationship to the to the universe and to magic to the goddesses I, I worked with changed. Did I clarify the question at all? <laughs> Did it make so. it worse? No, I think so. I think so. No, and, and, and it really, I think it really depends. I mean, I think, again, I think magic is also a, a, a construct, right? It's a way of us understanding mm -hmm. how to be in relationship with the universe. And so I think every culture has its own different ways of being with it. And I will say that, um, you know, over the years, as I said, my relationship with gender and magic has been very feminist in orientation in terms of the idea. I mean, but, you know, even if you look at the Kabbalah, right, we talk about the pillar of severity, the pillar of mercy, which are what you would think would be opposite. The pillar of severity is the is the feminine pillar, and the, pir right. the pillar of mercy is the masculine because one creates form and one exists as force. So it really depends on how you're approaching and what it is that you want to do. What I look at is this. I look at... Um, you know, because because I do work in a Celtic tradition, I do work in Brythonic Welsh tradition, I look at the stories, I look at the myths, and that's what kind of informs me. And I do see that there's a particular way that women are in spiritual service in all of these stories. And again, I do think that um, that was what we were emulating in the sisterhood. It's that that Avalon was a place that was ruled by nine women, that, um, that was involved in the granting and the rescinding of sovereignty, that it was a place of healing, uh, that uh, the these women served as psychopomps. They served as, um, as 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 those who mediate between this world and the other world in, a, in 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 many different ways. And I believe that's the fundamental functioning of magic in the Avalonian tradition is to serve as 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 the person that is the threshold guardian, the threshold keeper. That things can go one way or the other, and that's the mediating form, power uh, right. that women have. Right. That the feminine, uh, ex, you know, expresses in this mm -hmm. tradition. And, 
again, I think that um, I think that my you know with the Evelynian tradition is is we practice it. Uh, you know, we're looking at um, you know training women to come into their priestessing uh, in a way that they're in service to everyone, not just to women. I think right. that the goddess is not just for women, but I do think that uh, we can approach them in a particular way because of how we how we work. And, and how we work is based on the mythos. So do I think that men can't do the things that we that we do? I think a man who is connected uh, to their unconscious, who are who are who are uh, honoring and whole in their seeking their uh, their intuitive, deep wisdom, emotional expression self can do this work as well. Um uh, but I think that there's some integration that needs to happen to, for that to happen. And I think it's the case for women as well. I mean, we need to reclaim those pieces of us that have been decri- derided as our weakness, as our strength. That comes back to that sovereignty piece. Yeah. So so I don't know if that answer is necessarily, but that's kind of where I come to around it. And I, and I really do think that, um, you know, I would have answered this a lot differently 20 years ago, 30 oh, years sure. ago. Yeah. But, but I, um, I, I'm, I'm glad the things have evolved, but I do think that because uh, we are so, our foundation of our work is the mythos, is the lore, uh, that we, we try to emulate that in our practice. And certainly mm-hmm. men contact me all the time, all the time, both in person and online. Is it okay if I do the work? Yes, please, 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 please. Because I think Avalon is an island of healing. We all need healing. We all need integration. We all need empowerment. And the work that we do is geared towards that. And we all can do it. I think that that is the key. Um, So yes. So yes, I think that's connected. And I think it's part of the realms of the feminine, but I think the feminine is not owned by women. Okay. I like that. Um, Sorry, all of a sudden I'm like, whoops, I got a whole lot of things I got to think about. The I want to follow up on one point, because you had mentioned if if you have a man who is capable of integrating, I think in particular you meant integrating the unconsciousness, or integrating the unconscious more into the conscious. Did I understand that properly? Or Yes, that... that um... Right, that isn't afraid of or uh, othering or uh, of, of that part of themselves, because I and, okay. and it's the same. Maybe I maybe I maybe I misspoke that a little bit because I think that integration is 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 key to all of us. This is part of the okay. work, whether you're whether you're ma- ma- male or female, because we have to. For me, integration is the recognition of all aspects of ourselves, both okay. our light and our shadow. Right. So. Um, and the more conscious we are of the truth of who we are, the totality of who we are, the, the better the vessel that we are to be in service as a priestess. And that's, I think, the difference between being a priestess and priestessing, right, to me, which is a verb, it's something that we do, it's not something we hang up on our wall. Um, and someone who receives the healing that Avalon possesses. And I think one mediates it and one can be in relationship with it. And they're two different things that are part of the same okay. process. And it makes sense. Okay. Absolutely. No, that totally. Because like, the question I wanted to ask was really like how much, because it's all kind of development, right? I mean, when when you right. when you go into it, you go, well, my problems are really disintegration. You know, you, you don't see yourself as you as you are. And even if you do see yourself as you are, you don't manifest that. And that's part of the whole Avalonian cycle of healing. So... We help ourselves to the cycle that goes on around us, right? Yeah. To recognize that we are a part of nature, not mm-hmm. apart from it. And if we follow the pattern that's inherent, then see the reflection of it within us. It, it guides us through our own process, through our yeah. own ebb and flow, through our own shadow and light, through our own yield and fallowness. And we need to understand the lay of our inner landscape. And I think that's important for everyone to do. Yeah. Everyone needs to do that. Agreed. So, so beautiful. I just... That was exactly what I was hoping to hear. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, not really hoping to hear, but that was, I am so glad we got to that question. Mm-hmm. I, I do want to ask, like, what, what, um, how did you end up founding the, the whole sisterhood? Cause I mean, there's a distinction between going, wow, I got a really interesting idea. And then I'm going to bring it to, to the rest of, you know, the rest of the world. Cause it's 20, 
it's more than 20 years now that the the sisterhood's been in existence. I mean, it's not a long time. 30 years. It's next year, 30 next year years. will be 30 years. Yeah. So, I mean, I get asked that question a lot. And what I say is this, I inadvertently founded the Sisterhood of <laughs> Sure. So I, um, so I had been working with a, with a group uh, that was, you know, Celtic-ish, it was Avalonian-ish, but it really wasn't founded on uh, on lore, tradition. Mm. Um, so, and I had studied archaeology in undergrad, so I ran into them in um, in uh, in undergrad. And uh, when I left, I had a lot of like, okay, this is not in in accordance with what I know about the culture, about the lore, all this kind of stuff. So I spent some time. I had moved to Atlanta. I was going to chiropractic school, all the things, and um, and so I was like, oh, but I want to find. So as I'm doing this and trying to fit in my understanding of the actual culture and what we do know from things historically and, you know, um, from lore and from myth. Um, I, um, I put out a website. It was 1995. I, I'm a Gemini. I loved, you know, the idea of this interconnectivity with people. I put up a website looking for the women who loved Avalon. And what wound up happening was people were contacting me saying, I love Avalon and I want to learn how to do this. Will you teach me? And that's what wound up starting. So we were doing AOL chat rooms. It was hilarious. Sure. We had Yahoo groups. And uh, we, inter- you know, in t- t- and it just grew from there. So 30 years, uh, we uh, we became a nonprofit organization in 2000, you know, 501c3 status. Uh, so it just kept growing and the vision kept uh, growing women who loved the work that we were doing, uh, supporting it. We have, uh, it's, um, you know, we have multiple bodies. We, we emulated what Avalon was like. We have a council of nine. We have a board of trustees. It's not just about one person. And we have, we have, we have members all over the world. We've had thousands of members. And, um, oh, gosh. Cool. and it's just grown from there and just the work has grown from there as well. So that, that was really it. But the foundation of the work is what you see in Avalon Within. It's the first book that I wrote, because I do think that we need to know ourselves as well as we can in order to do the next work, the next, um, and the next work is Mythic Moons, um, which is about the goddesses and the herbs and the healing aspects and, and, you know, and the lore pieces and the myth. And then the Ninefold Way of Avalon is about, um, so there's like three, I guess, in the series, is about that ninefold piece that is specifically about Avalon, what we know about Avalon over time and how it's important for us here and now today, um, how we can follow that path and what that says to us as women and how we can be in service as priestesses and um, and, and that, that that service is open to everyone. And like I said, I get men all the time, sometimes just, oh, is it okay? And I'm just, yes. It, and, right. and I really, truly believe that. I really, truly believe this. There is nothing that is barred to someone who can open that door. And if you do the work and things are, come to you and you receive that information or that blessing or that that transformation, then it, it's meant for you. You earned it. You, you got there. I, I am not in the business of disallowing or telling people they're doing it wrong or I don't, you know, I don't... Um, we're not in the business of uh, making priestesses. Uh, you know, we feel that uh, everyone has that option. And so how can we be the best priestesses that we can be? How can we can be in sovereign right. service to each other? That's the work that we do. So, right. um, yeah. I, that's how I opened this conversation, though, didn't I? I said, oh, I first found this in 2017, but I went, oh, dang, I'm a man. Oh, well. If well, only I had known because maybe we would have talked earlier. Really. Yeah. yeah. Well, but we are we are open to all women, to all women. Yes. Yeah. Much of the cuz I, you know, just for the the audience, the Avalonian cycle of healing, you can actually I already held up the book, but I'm going to hold it up again. You can find it actually in this book Avalon Within, which incidentally just I mean, I just want to gush for a moment cuz like the <sighs> The history that you put into this, all of this, all the the scholarship, this and Mythic Moons, by the way, which I I told Jenna earlier, I have yet to read her third book. I'm, I'm, I'll get there. She's not going to let me publish this before I finish the book. I think. But anyway, no, 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 no. One of one of the <laughs> one of the biggest parts of the cycle of healing is acknowledging that there is light and dark. And I, mm-hmm. I have this conversation in podcasts all the time. And this is probably somebody listening right now going, oh, God, I wondered when they were going to get into, you know, light and dark. We don't want to see the dark. 
we never want to see the dark. Mm -hmm. We have this idea that, you know, it's always summer, right? The, the, the stock market will always rise. Our, our salaries will always increase. We'll always get a promotion, you know, your, your allegory here, the dark, why is the dark so important? I mean, the dark is who part of who we are. We store um, so much in the unconscious. We so, store so much in our shadow. And, you know, talk about allegory, right? It's, uh, it's it, um, uh, Joseph Campbell who said, right, to, you know, the, the, the gift that you seek is in the cave you dare not enter, right? The, the treasure you seek. And so you can't be sovereign unless you understand yourself. You have to go into the badlands of that inner landscape to understand our fears, our hurts, our shames, the things that people told us about ourselves were not right, the things that we deemed for ourselves were, uh, you know, I'm ashamed of this thing or something that I did that was bad or something I believe that is wrong, whether or, or even traumas that we've experienced that we've kind of shoved away. When they're unconscious, they control us. They move through us. We're making choices. That's why I said conscious self-determination, because we can make choices all the time. We can say no to things and yes to things and feel like we're coming from a place of strength. But if we don't know the reason why we're saying yes or no, it could be because of a fear. It could be because of some ingrained belief that we're not good enough and therefore we must say yes to people. So we feel like we're being really kind of sovereign and saying, yes, I'm going to do all the things. But in reality, the, the reason behind the yes is because I'm afraid people are going to know that I am this piece of crap and that you know, they're not going to like me. So I'm going to do the thing. You know, these are the things that are important for us to know. And we are whole when we understand those things. We all have shadow. We all have things that we that perhaps we haven't lived up our own expectations, or perhaps we've been told or bad about ourselves, or that we're afraid of, or that we're hurt, or has happened to us. But that is part of who we are. We cannot bypass those things things. It is important for us to know them, to love them, to acknowledge that it's part of who we are and to move forward and to not shame each other. That's because that's what I see a lot in, in spiritual community. When we have that spiritual bypassing piece, it's that I'm too evolved to feel jealousy. I'm too <laughs> evolved to get angry at someone who is, you know, trampling on my boundaries. I'm too evolved to consider that, um, you know, maybe I didn't have the collective interest in mind there, that maybe it was just what I wanted for myself. <laughs> and that is where we get into trouble. That is where we get into trouble. We need to accept ourselves as we are and have that grace for other people, that it can't be you've messed up once, therefore we're throwing you out the baby and the bathwater, sure. right? Let's call people in. Let's say, hey, you know what? God knows, I, I, I appreciate all the times I've been called in because it's given me an opportunity to learn, to not react, to not, you know, oh, you know, get defensive. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think we all need that grace because that's how we shift and that's how we change and that's how we grow and that's where transformation lies. So you have to know those things. You have to. Um, and it's, it's the biggest gift you can give yourself is to go into the bad line, go, go into the bad lands to see the parts of ourselves that need growth, that need healing, that need, that need love, that need right, to be held right. and, and carried. So I agree with you. And I've written something around, n not necessarily the, the, the dark. Well, yes, true as well. But <clears throat> one of the things that I've recognized about Western society is Normal human experiences, such as you've talked about trauma. I mean, and I'm not saying trauma's good necessarily, but trauma and our responses to trauma, these have become pathologies to, to psychology. These are pathologies. And the anxiety that we feel, if it whether it's diso in dissociation, there are a lot of, I'm going to call them normal human experiences, common and frequent human mm -hmm. experiences that we've labeled as pathologies, you just told me these are the things that we should love and we should bring out and care for them. Where did Western medicine go wrong? That's a big question. You know, I think the thing is this, I think that, and I do believe this, our shadow evolves and, and, and things go in there uh, to help us survive situations, right? So when we yeah. experience trauma, when we're in horrible situations, right, uh, we have to adapt a particular way of being to survive it. I think when it, where it becomes a pathology is when we're no longer in those situations, but we're still reacting to what's in front of us as if what is behind us is still 
happening. That's where it's pathological. That's why we have to understand where our shadow comes from. That when we hear a, a certain tone of voice, it brings us back to our childhood where there was domestic violence. And so we see what's in front of us as eminent domestic violence when really it's just people speaking loudly. And so if that understanding can come through and we can say, this feels like an unsafe thing. It's triggering me because I've been in unsafe situations that feel like this. Is that really what's happening here? And if it is, then thank, thank you, Shadow, for saving me from this. Or I can take a breath and say, I can not run away. I cannot react angrily or, 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 or defensively because something else is possible here. And I think that's where we have, that's where, that's where it becomes a, a pathology. When it continues to be active in our lives, when the situation that birthed it is no longer present. And that's, yeah. I think, when, when, you know, all the sages say, be here now, right? That's what it means. It means see the clarity, with clarity, what's happening, not from the eyes of the past and the fear and the hurt of what's happened, and not with the anxiety for the future of the possible ways in which things can go wrong, but just as things are in the here and the now. That is the powerful place. And that is the place of the threshold. This is the thing that I talk about with the magic, uh, the priestessing magic, is that this is the moment where changes happen. You can't change the past, you can work towards a future, but it's only in this moment that we can make those choices. And we have to be presently here. Otherwise, we keep making choices based on past fear, or we keep making choices based on future anxiety, and we're not where we need, need to be. And that's where the pathology comes in. That's what I think. I think that was beautiful. And I wish psychology and psychiatry view, <laughs> viewed it the same. I, I have a lot of, I will say, I have a lot of friends who are psychotherapists and I've studied um, stuff, not from a clinical perspective, but, uh, you know, transpersonal psychology and things like that. Sure. I think there are people who do embrace that. Yes. But I think uh, the medical model is a different piece, right? Because it's, you know, about alleviating the symptoms of things. We're not addressing right. the core of it. Yeah. So right. and, and that I think is absolutely the issue. Yeah. And, and I think that's, yeah. I think that was a, that's the thing that I react to that I just go, you know, you can't, mm -hmm. you cannot heal away a trauma Unless you acknowledge it and feel it and feel like feel that pain and it's not going to be fun. You know, this is why it's in the shadow, as you've said, this is why it's in the cave. It's, it's not going to be fun. And yet a lot of the medical model is, Hey, I'm just going to give you a pill. You feel anxious. Oh, that's fine. We got a pill. Well, you go to a butcher, they're going to sell you meat. You go to <laughs> someone who deals with pharmaceuticals, they're going to give you pharmaceuticals. Okay, or they're fair. Give you surgery. <laughs> That's but this fair. is the thing, and and, and but here's here's a place where mythology can really help us heal. So the story of Caridwen is about she has a son who's the ugliest. You look upon him and you shudder. He was so sure. ugly, and she knows he's not going to be accepted by the world around him. So she decides that the other thing that, that her society likes, in, in addition to beauty and wholeness, physical beauty and physical wholeness, is wisdom. So she brews this brew of wisdom, and there's this whole thing that goes on. And the person who helps make it steals the drops, and there's this whole transformation thing. We think it's an encoded, uh, you know, initiation rite for bards to receive the Awen, but her son of Gavi is his name. His name is Utter Darkness. He never receives the drops that are meant for him. And so the question is always, well, what happens to Avgadi? Because Gwion Bach becomes Taliesin, the shining brow. He receives the wisdom. What happens to her ugly, ugly son? And, you know, I think that Caridon also has a beautiful, so she has the most beautiful woman as her daughter, the most ugly man as her son, right? So parts of ourselves are light and our shadow. But here's the thing about Evgavi. He winds up becoming one of the greatest warriors in Arthur's yeah, court. Right. Because he's so ugly, he scares the hell out of everyone else on the battlefield. And as they're in shock, thinking this like demon from hell is, is, is you know, coming after them, he just kills them all. Sure. So here's a situation where Guion becomes he receives wisdom. He transforms. There's the parts of ourselves that are innocent that need to transform. They need to change. It needs to heal. And But then there are the parts of ourselves that will never be healed, can only be carried. And we can take those parts of ourselves that remain in the shadow and carry it with grace and find ways of finding strength in it. That became the oh thing that his mother 
a goddess who loves him, wanting the best for him, thinks the best for him is to become wise. But in truth, it was the very thing that she was seeking to change that became the thing that gave him renown, that gave him purpose, that allowed him to make a difference in the world. And I think it's the same for us. So we need to have the courage to look at those things, to accept the parts of ourselves. Because here's the thing. If you lose a leg in a war, your leg is gone. You may have an assistive device that helped you walk again. There are the ways of mobility, but that leg is gone. So we learn different ways of carrying the, sure. you know, the things we've been through. And I think that's the case for us as well. So transform what we can, accept and love what we can't, right? And how can we move forward with grace with that? So not everything can change. Not everything can be changed, but it is still who we are. And there's yeah. the power there. God, there was, I, I gotta tell you, I read that in your book, how you, how you've, you reframed ultimately, mm. you know, I'll call him more friend because of ugly just feels bad for the yes. poor kid. I'm like, yo, sure. geez, utter darkness, kid. But, but, but the, the way, the way that you just framed that, it didn't strike me until right now. So really, I think what I'm trying to say is like, thank you. Oh my gosh. The idea that, that mm -hmm. you can have something that is so horrible that ends up becoming a strength. Like that's beautiful. That's a beautiful way to put that. I also, I had not seen, because for what it's worth, and, and I'm not going to name any names here, but the way I had originally read that story, Guillaume Bach is a little bit of a, like a hero almost. And the way you're telling the story, he's more of a villain, jumps in front of, of, of Morfran, right? I'm going to get the drops. The way I had read it was sort of accidental. And he's like, oops. Crap, I suddenly turned into Taliesin. and I better run like hell, make four changes, including turning into wheat. You know, I mean, I like this better for what it's worth. I like how he has some sort of agency in the agency. I think I think the one where he he does it by accident is kind of a conflation because there's a similar story in Irish tradition sure. about uh you know in the cool, right? And yeah, how he, he right. ate the salmon. It was done by accident. Right. Uh, but I think the original Welsh, it is more of, you know, Guyon moving him out of the way. But here's the thing. Uh Caridwen made him earn it. So he was a little shit. Although you could say he's the one who kind of did the work, right? He was the one sure. who was stirring with the cauldron. Sure. So, you know, who knows what the goddess had in mind there? Why didn't she have her son do the thing? So it's an interesting question. But she made him earn it. He had to change through all oh. of the elements, earth, air, fire, water, then die from the whole self to be reborn anew. Right. So in the end, yes, he definitely earns what he what he received, but she made sure that he got it. Right. Yeah. So absolutely. It, yeah. Right. That's working. I mean, you go through the go mm -hmm. through the four stages, you get eaten, right. reborn, stuck in a coracle for, for nine months, I believe, out believe out beyond the ninth wave and back, I think is the the story found in a salmon weir, right? <laughs> found yep. in the salmon weir by the guy, whoever the guy was, I forget. Yeah. El Elvin, who's a Welsh prince. Yep. Wow. Oh no, wait, you told you have a degree in this. Like that's unfair. <laughs> well, it's not a contest. We're just together no, building I, the story. True, yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. But but it it is true, yeah. Because and I don't know that Taliesin ends up with a really like easy existence either. Cause then like the, everybody's mm -hmm. coming after him. Oh, I'm, you're, you're the best part of the land. No, I'm the best part of the land. So, okay. Let me compose another poem for crap's sake. I'll tell you what, Let me tell you. this one I'm going to write about trees. Okay. You'll love it. A lot of trees. There's a battle of trees. <laughs> oh, it's always good to make crummy you know, Welsh poem, Welsh, Welsh mythology. Welsh bardic poetry bow uh, jokes. Yes. It's a very <laughs> neat, neat audience I found, but I am that audience. And so are you apparently. So sorry, everybody else. Right. If you're not. But yeah. Everybody else. Stuff. Yeah. Everybody else is like, it's yeah, I hope they move on soon. What is this? <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> okay. I do want, I do have, I, I want to ask you one, like one more major question here because mm -hmm. you've, you've, interrelated the um the cycle of the sun in, in avalon within and you've integrated the sorry what word did i just use you you've you've used the cycle of the sun for for the Avalo, avalonian cycle of healing and then you integrate mm -hmm. the cycles of the moon within the year within the sun um as as a secondary path around that um 
I got to figure out how I want to answer, how I even want to ask this question. What I, the question I want to ask is around cyclicity because mm -hmm. It's easier, I, in my opinion, like you, if you tell somebody the cycle of the, the seasons, if you tell them the wheel of mm -hmm. the year, people get mm -hmm. that. Right. And when I read Mythic Moons, personally, I went, oh, good. I'm glad she talked about the moon because the moon is, is so huge, particularly in, in Celtic, you know, mythology. Mm -hmm. So, so here we go. I'm trying to formulate this. Why start with the sun, I guess? Why why did it take the second book to get into the, the refinement, I suppose? So that's a good question. I do kind of talk about... The reason why uh, uh, there's a different name altogether, that it's the cycle of healing, is because yes. I think the stations of the cycle can be reflected onto many different cycles. The cycle yes. of the seasons, the cycle of the day, right? So there are four phases of the day. And so th there is a lunar cycle in there, the phases of the moon, right? The four major moon phases are part of that cycle of, of healing. But the cycle of revealing talks about the year and the moon, the lunar, the lunar, the, you know, the 13 moons of the year. So it kind of pulls out that piece. And part of the reason is because I'm, I'm, I'm tying into the myth. Um, and when you read the ninefold, uh, you'll see uh, okay. as well that there's there's a, okay so there is a Kyer in the in the Welsh other world in Anuven called Kyer Pedevran and it is the fourfold uh, uh, revolving fortress mm -hmm. and within Kyer Pedevran are nine maidens who uh, who tend and kindle with their breath a, a cauldron that has pearls around its. Uh, its border. And from that cauldron comes poetry and prophecy, and it will not boil the food of a coward. So this is kind of this Avalonian cosmology. So there are these nine maidens who are these nine muses, and it's a reflection of the nine sisters of Avalon. And there's this cauldron that is a cauldron of sovereignty, because it is a testing cauldron, but it's also the cauldron of poetry and prophecy, and uh, Alwyn comes from it. I see the pearls around the rim as the, as the moons of the year, Right. So it integrates the myths of the goddesses throughout the year. And so we we deal with or not we deal with we 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 reflect par portions of these Welsh goddesses that we work with in the Avalonian tradition uh, into ourselves and say, this is the story. We start with the story of Ceridwen. We end with the story of Bronwyn. We, we look at the stories of these goddesses from Welsh story and reflect it within ourselves. So it's the moon. It's the cycle of of. of um, oh, gosh, it just went out of my head. Uh, um of revealing, right? The revelation of the, the inner self through these lunar keys. And they have to do with the herbs of Avalon is a healing piece, the myths of Avalon, uh, which are the stories of these Welsh goddesses, and then the, the times of the year that are connected to it. So it's, it, 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 it and they kind of work together. It's sort of like a spirograph is somehow how I, how I teach it, yes. but they kind of clockwork yeah. together. And then the nine yeah. uh, are part yeah. of that. So there's the nine sisters and nine maidens. Then there's the cauldron with, with the pearls around it. And then the fourfold fortress with the cauldron at the center. That's the cycle of healing. So it's the cycle of healing, cycle of revealing, and then those threshold people. So all of them are in that one chire. So that's kind of the Avalonian cosmology. So one builds upon the next in terms of... Um, the way, the way we engage with the myth and the way we engage with the tradition. Okay. All right. It was good. I, you know, just, I don't know. I saw the sun and I went, oh, sun doesn't feel so feminine. <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends on, well, I think in Egyptian myth, the sun was feminine. So. In, uh, in Irish, uh, Grania is a, is a solar goddess. Okay. All right. All um, right. And in, and in, uh, I think uh, in, in Norse, the, the the moon is male. In Welsh, we don't have those kinds of necessarily. We have gods of light. Yeah. Uh, Ariane Road is the silver wheel, potentially as a lunar goddess. So it's yeah. not it's not as cut and dry as in other places. But but I do see the the moon there. But I think I think the big thing is this. I think most pagans uh, and most people are. In alignment. I mean, we understand, we see, you know, the cycle of the seasons is very clear. You know, we, we, we're conscious, whether we're conscious of it or not, we, we're aware of its existence. Not everybody looks up at the moon at night. Not everybody, uh, you know, even understands right. how the moon works in terms of like the phases or the science behind it. So it is one of those things that it's sort of like a mystery in plain sight, right? And I think people need to actually delve into it. But I think most people who live in kind of temperate zones understand the, you know, the cycle of the four seasons. Yeah. So I think it's easy for us to kind of resonate with that. All right. That, 
that makes good sense because it was certainly mm-hmm. an easier cycle. Because I know when I was a kid, my father had land in the uh, the California high desert, and we were, I mean, ugh, 60, 70 miles from, from like any city. It was the first time I mm-hmm. had ever seen like the actual Milky Way. And mm. being able to watch the moon in that environment was, was fascinating. And I never understood mm. it, you know, for the longest time I was like, how does that work? Why is that? Like, it's, it seems like it's in the, a different place every night, which it is. I mean, I get that. You're going to go, yeah, well right, done. Right. Well done, Amy. You actually like observed something, but well, it's weird. So people think are like, wow, why is the moon up? <laughs> it's the, it's, daytime it's like yes yes yes. right i mean you know there was somebody who said something about uh, you know the i'm trying to remember what it was that i heard something about the full moon being out with the sun or i saw the full moon next to the sun and i'm like i don't i'm not sure that could have happened and they're like no i I mean the closest is that the the full moon rises when the sun sets when the sun sets right and the full moon the the dark moon and the sun move together right because they're in the same part of the sky which is why it's not illuminated but it's all this is the thing it's all an illusion based on perspective because we are Mm. making an angle so we're the vertex of an angle between the moon and the sun and what we see in terms of those um you know the phases is just an illusion. And that's why in Mythic Moons, I talk about the sovereign moon. The yes. sovereign moon yes. is that ninth phase that says, this is the moon as it is without light and shadow projected upon it or, uh, you know, projecting out from it. And that's what we need right. to come to. The moon is what it is. And we are who we are. So what are the projections that we've accepted from others? Uh, how do we see ourselves in relationship to other things in our lives? And have we gotten ourselves into a life situation where the truth of who we are is supported by the relationships that we have. And if not, if the person that we are outside of context is not the same person that we are inside of context, and it's not to say that you have to be who you are 24 hours a day, obviously the person that's at work and the person that's at home are going to be different people, but if the core of who you are isn't being supported, then that's something that we need to, to look at about ourselves. So it is, it is about that as well. A powerful allegory, I think. Absolutely. And it just struck me too. We just had a blue super moon. That was probably huge. We did. Yeah. There was, yeah. Did you have a good night? Was that a good night for you? I was actually still, I was still, I was, I just came back from the UK a couple of weeks ago. So I was over there. So yeah, uh, it was, it was quite amazing. Yeah, it was quite amazing. I really want to ask what you were doing, but I'm not going to, because that's too personal. (laughs) Well, I was in, I was in, um, oh gosh, it was my last night in Wales before we went to Glastonbury for the Goddess Conference. I was staying with a sister. So we did some, some sistery things. (laughs) Okay. So you were at the Goddess Conference. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't even think about that. I so want to go see Glastonbury. I don't, I, now I have a different, um, I was looking at that. Is that a, is that a, it's well, so it's a, a, I'll see what I can do here folks. But yeah, so it's a Vesica. Oops. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Now, now I've got my boobs hidden on the microphone, but so Vesica pieces with a triple moon under it. So I, I designed Mm -hmm. this, your, your ask. So I'm going to tell you, no, I designed this. Be- because so the Vesica pieces has always spoken to me very because I, I there's an integration there, and maybe if mm-hmm. if if you know what I see is is a, is a god and goddess integration, and perhaps you know thinking about me and my life, you know maybe it makes sense that the Vesica pieces would would be important, but I've always loved the moon as well and the the triple mm-hmm. moon aspect, mm-hmm. the triple goddesses have always. I just adore that. I, you know, I cannot get enough about moon goddesses. Just love it. So, so I designed this. This is the only one in existence. Um, cause I, cause I, it was really hard for me to find somebody to make it. Like I went to a couple mm. of jewelers and they're like, yeah, this is going to be hard. It's gonna be... Ultimately somebody made a 3d model of it and I sent it to a place that cast it from the 3d model. But anyway, oh, Vesica yeah. pieces and, and, and triple moon. I do love this, mm-hmm. but I used to wear the, um, I, I think it's above the, I think it's above the white spring. I think the, 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 the yes, yes. It's above, I used to have that on a, I mean, I still have it. It's in my 
I just looked at it mm-hmm. earlier, but I used to wear that as a as a pendant, the chalice. Well, um, mm-hmm. I don't not manhole Lid. cover. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Lid. Certainly better than manhole cover. <laughs> Jeez, but so we used to love that. What what was it? Where was I going with this? Oh, th- there you go. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. Cool. Perfect. But it has the sphere. Right. So that's the difference between it. I also prefer it. Yes. I prefer it without the without the spear in the in the center of it. Right. I just like it um, the way you have it. I, I think it's a beautiful well. symbol. I think it's a beautiful symbol. One thing I will say, and, and, you know, everybody feel free to disagree. I don't care. I don't like the vesica pieces vertical. I, w- I want mm-hmm. it horizontal because mm-hmm. to me, and, and this will go all maybe airy fairy feminist on you, but if you have one above the other, I can't do, I'm trying to do this in the camera. If you have one above the mm-hmm. other, there's a sense of hierarchy mm-hmm. and I don't like that. <laughs> so part of when I made this, I said, no, they need to be mm-hmm. on the same level interlocking. So it was I all that, that just because I wanted to go to Glastonbury? Well, it was like five minutes worth of conversation on my jewelry that... Well, it's beautiful. And I love Thank that you. you have that. And I agree with you. I agree with you that they do different things in the, in the depending on uh, the direction that they're in. And it's definitely something that I work with in different ways because of that. They do do different things. But I do like it without the spear. And I like it in that direction as well because it does have that yonic shape in the center, right? That's energy of birthing and... Yeah. Right, which makes much more center sense horizontally. So, mm-hmm. um, I hate to do this. We're 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 pretty much at the end of time, and and uh, not like you know the restaurants at the end of the universe kind of thing. But that would be I have cool. my towel. <laughs> right, that's good. I'm glad you've got that. Yeah, Can. No. I'm going to put, I have, what do I have? One, two, oh, you added one. I have like six, there's like six URLs here, but the, you know, we're asking people to read, which can be tough. Do you, and it's fine. Everybody out there who doesn't want to read, like it's cool. Um, can you tell us how we can find Jenna, Jenna Tellendrew, please? Uh, so, yeah. So um, my website is, uh, it's the Welsh for the island of Avalon. So that can sometimes also be problematic. So it's Unis, Y-N-Y-S, A-F is in Frank, A-L-L-O-N.com. Or sisterhoodofavalon.org. Or I'm the only one with my name. So if you just put that in, J-H-E-N-A-H, uh, you'll find me. And I'm on all the socials. I haven't done the TikToks and the things like that because I am I am a little old. But maybe one day I will uh, think of, of, you know foray into the uh the, you know i was very the video genre oh but you like you do i was so glad to see all of the the meditations on your youtube channel because mm-hmm. the, the like the guided meditations because i was like oh my gosh i'm gonna have to listen to myself read this yeah crap. that's why i did it people were like i hate oh, it on, and dude. so i have more comments the ones Good. from mythic moons i'm gonna i'm working on this winter so hopefully i'll have those up oh perfect soon. perfect I will, if you need like help editing or something, like I'm willing to help out. Don't, don't, yeah. Oh, you're very kind. No, 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 no. Because I'd love to, because I, I would love them is my point. Anything I can do to speed this up, if you get where I'm going. <laughs> I get it. No, I appreciate it. No, d- d- deeply. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Jen, I just, I got to say thank you. I'm, I'm still, I still have a little bit of palpitations. But because I keep oh. on looking at you and going, wow, look, I'm talking to Jenna Tellendrew. It's so amazing. Oh, you're very kind, but I'm a goof, as you can see. And the thing that I usually get when people meet me is you're very, you're much taller on the internet, which is true, because um, I'm only five feet tall. And uh, right. yeah, I don't know. People think because, you know, you, you're, you do the academic thing or, you know, that you're going to be stuffy, but I'm so not that. So I, I'd rather people think the opposite but anyway yeah. uh I, I, this has been so lovely and i've really appreciated getting to know you and sharing with thank you, you and you. uh what a fab conversation so yeah thank you. i hope so i this was amazing i'm i'm super excited that we were able to to you know to connect up so i guess i will say to our audience i really don't want to do this like so much do i want to go you know what i'm going to keep talking to you but i want to respect your time everybody else's time wow. so yeah 
to all of our Happy listeners. Back. I would love to. No, I would absolutely love to. So um, to all of our listeners, I will certainly say thank you for listening. My name is Amethyst Herrick. I've been speaking with Jenna Tellendrew on Gender Identity Weekly. And I always love to have like what we've been talking about. And I think what, what I want to say today is that we've been talking about all the power that comes out of the dark. Mm. Do you like that? Mm -hmm. Is that good? Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Really, truly. Absolutely.